We don't write letters as we used to. We may write a lot of emails and sometimes a letter. But communication's involved in all of it. Something we want when we write something, others to understand. And when they write us, they want us to understand. So letters or epistles have been around a long time, and it's interesting that the Lord in His wisdom saw fit to give us His last will and testament in the form of epistles and letters. The apostles' work, the Apostle Paul, at Corinth in Achaia, Greece, was so well known that he didn't need an epistle of commendation to the brethren or a letter of commendation from them. So here's what he wrote as the Spirit inspired him to write it. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> Do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So Paul penned a letter to the church at Corinth, the letter which we're reading and one before it, that was known and was read. By the same token, members of the body of Christ were also known and read. That's an interesting thing, and let's sink in. He's saying people can look at us and read us, actually read us by the way we speak and do and where we don't go and where we do go. Christ had affirmed while he was on the earth that such is true when he said, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Then he said, Ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on the sand, and it shineth unto all that are in the house. Even so, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. That's simply saying the life that we as Christians live as faithful children of God is going to be noticed. Someone is watching. They may not like you. They may not care a thing for the things that you profess. But they will note what you profess and whether you're living according to it. So we are either a good influence on others or a bad influence on others. Now think for a minute. Could there be an in-between? Well, no. Influence is that which we exercise over others by the way we live. So it can be good or bad, but there's no in-between. And this is why the great Apostle Paul admonished, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Colossians 4, 5. Let me look for a moment at redeeming the time. It means buying it back. So much of our time over the years, some more than others, has been spent without thinking about God or doing His will. So when you're converted to Christ in obedience to the gospel, then you're very concerned about your time and using it as the Lord authorizes it to be used. 
Thus we're walking or living in wisdom before all, thus before those outside of Christ. We do not want to cause them by our life to think certain things are right when they are not because we're not cautious about what we do, where we choose to go, and so on. So we need to learn some of the things that it means to be a living epistle, living letters, for such, the Bible says, members of the church are. Well, a letter is carefully prepared and written. Think about the last time you wrote an email, which is a form of a letter, or whatever way you thought to communicate to somebody else what was on your mind. Well, according to the seriousness of the material covered in your letter and what you're communicating to the other party, you're particular about what you write. Have you ever written down and said, well, I've got to go back over this and brush it up and choose the words I want. Those of us who are involved in writing and editing and things like that, that becomes a, I don't know what to say, it becomes a sign before our eyes because no matter what we write and how well we work on it and this we talk about among ourselves, as soon as the final product appears, there you see where the ought to have been or where a letter was left out. And you ask yourself time and time again, why couldn't I see that before it went to press? Well, that shows you if we are letters written so all men can read us, how cautious we ought to be about the way we conduct ourselves before everybody, and especially those who are not Christians. Jesus said to the apostles, his apostles, but the Comforter, even the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said unto you. John 14, 26. Well, that's talking about the revelation of the New Testament of Christ, beginning with the apostles. Well, the New Testament then contained the truth of God, the will of God. And they were written to be of great benefit to all mankind. <clears throat> and today, when we study it, we not only try to understand the English translation, we try to go back and study something of the original words the Holy Spirit had these writers of the New Testament use. Even then, there's problems with some things. We must remember that when the whole Roman world in the first century spoke and wrote Greek, that it was Peter who said of Paul's writings who wrote in Greek, there's some things he writes that are hard to be understood. Well, it wasn't because neither one of them wasn't conversant in Greek is because of the nature of the information as it was presented. I reminded somebody a while back when it was in a class on Greek and several were commenting. I said, do you realize that back when everybody spoke and wrote Greek and the Holy Spirit inspired these writers of the New Testament to write these letters, that they were dealing with people who deviated from the truth, who corrupted the truth, and that was long before there ever was an English language and many other languages that are around today. So it would be nice to be able to read the Greek as Paul read it and understood it and could write it. That'd be nice. But that's not going to prevent altogether error to be had because Peter said they twisted the truth. And he said that in Greek about Greek-speaking people and about others who wrote in Greek. So while I think it's important to study the Greek, if you have a real genuine translation, you've got what he said in the Greek. Because even when it comes to translating Greek, striving your best to say in English what was said in the Greek, no more, no less, you still have choices of words to use. And so the English translators of the Greek have used sometimes different words. 
That doesn't mean that they haven't said what was said in Greek. It's just in English you can say that in different ways. And that needs to be understood about all kinds of translating. And if you were a good translator, translating from German to English or French to English or Chinese to English, then you would know that a translator has some leeway as to which word he chooses to express what was said in the original language. So what about us? We're letters. Each one of us are being read by one another and by those outside the church. So that can only be carried so far. The main thing that's being said is, are you living like the Bible said? On the first day of the week, where are you going to be present? Well, you're going to assemble with other saints of like precious faith, and you're going to do in those assemblies what God said was to be done upon the first day of the week in the worship of Him. And each act of worship will be that which you're mindful of because you've gleaned it from the authoritative word of Christ as to the assembly and what's done in that assembly. And people then who are even assembling with us can see then what we do. And thus we ought to be able to answer them why we do each one of them. That helps us then even to teach. When people say, well, why do you do this? Why do you do that? And if we don't know the New Testament well enough to know why, then we're lacking. But be that as it may, we're already known by all men. So individual members of the body of Christ are epistles Known and read by all men, 1 Corinthians 3, 2. The workplace these days, since most people are about as worldly as they can be, and what all that implies that they do in their life and how they speak, we have ample opportunity to be able to take occasion when they ask us why this or why that, to be able to say that's a wide open door for me to say here's why I don't cuss. Here's why I don't tell dirty jokes. Here's why I don't do this, that, or the other. Or here is why I do this, that, or the other. Now, they may not care about it, and yet there may be that one out there that that strikes a spark of interest that says this is different. This is not the ordinary way people are living all around me. And thus, they've read something in our lives that may make them want to look further Never should we conduct ourselves in such a manner that it would produce any kind of spot or blemish upon the precious body of Jesus Christ, Ephesians 5 and verse 27. Well, then, another thing about an epistle, a letter, an epistle contains a message from the writer. We've already established that. We need to think about it maybe just a little more. By the way I live, I send the message. I send the message. I send the message of either living like the New Testament teaches or I don't. So if I profess being a Christian like you read of in the Bible, then I need to be sending the proper message of a Christian. The books of the New Testament were written to encourage, to admonish, and to rebuke those who read them. The writers who wrote them truly were inspired, and according to what we read in John 14, 26, they wrote only what the Holy Spirit guided and gave them to write. But I'm glad for that because that means the Word of God is infallible. It is authoritative because it is infallible, and that's so because it is from God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And a true prophet... Primarily, the idea of prophet is a teacher of the truth. A true prophet always spoke the truth. Remember that God in the Old Testament said to Ezekiel, And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. Ezekiel 2.7. Well, what that means is, is that I, if I am to be read by all men because I am an epistle, then I live the truth before them. It may not change them at all. 
But that's not the point. I've done my part. I've set the proper example. I've used every opportunity I could to teach the truth. New Testament Christians, as epistles of Christ, are obligated to do as the Apostle Paul admonished the young preacher Timothy to do. Preach the word. Be instant. American Standards said urgent. In season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, Second Timothy four two. Have you ever noticed how really we don't get too urgent about much of anything? <laughs> and yet the preaching of the word, the person that preaches it ought to be urgent. He ought to be instant. Every opportunity is looking for that opportunity to teach the truth. Well, isn't that true about the way we live? If we're epistles, known and read of all men. All Christians are not evangelists. But all, every one of us, old and young, are responsible for holding forth the word of life. Philippians 2.16. We do that in such a manner that it never detracts from the cause of Christ. Thus we show forth Christ living in us. An epistle needs to be legible. I can't remember now. I've been trying to see so many doctors the last couple of weeks, but somewhere before one of them, I, they had me write something down. And I said, well, I hope you can read that. And she looked at me. She said, we read doctors writing all the time. I said, well, I do hope it's a little better than that. And so an epistle needs to be legible. Now think for a minute. You get a letter from somebody, but you can't read it. You don't know what it says. How do you benefit from it? You don't. The letter needs to be clear, easily discerned, so that no misunderstanding will occur. There are some people who, if they can use a big word, they'll use it when two or three little words would make it clear. And we ought to be looking for the words that make it clear to the ordinary person. They shouldn't have to have a college education to be able to understand what we write. Now, I know that we all have to have some knowledge and education to be able, well, that's just the idea of reading. That's being educated to be able to read. So I understand that. But in choosing words, it is good to try to choose those words that the ordinary person doesn't have to always go to a dictionary to try to find out everything. And I'm certainly for dictionaries because they give us the exact present day in our vocabulary usage. If you're going to find out what it was like in the Bible days of the first century or the Old Testament, you use a Bible dictionary. You don't use one of our regular dictionaries such as Webster's. People need also to learn which dictionaries to use to find out what a word means. If you look up baptism in English, it's going to have every way a person uses baptism today and every definition they give to it. Well, that's not where to go to learn about baptism. That's a biblical term. You go to the Bible to learn what it means. And you look up those words as they were used when the New Testament was being written. But it needs to be clear and easily discerned so the, do your best so no misunderstanding can take place. I realize that many people don't hear what you say. Or they hear part of what you say. I've never seen a preacher that at one time in their life, if they preached over a period of years, that somebody didn't want to correct their grammar and so forth. Well, that's all right. Preachers ought to have some basic use of grammar. How, how do you communicate without grammar? <laughs> one time a lady said to a preacher, she was talking about the tenses of the verbs he used in his sermon and how that... He should have used this rather than that, whatever it was. And he thanked her for it and then said, Would you mind telling me what my sermon was about and the points I was making in it? She couldn't do it. 
I said, well, I'm glad you at least caught that, you know, where I was wrong in the grammar, even though you get the message of the sermon. So we can be thinking about certain things that cause us to miss the most important matter. And that can happen between the husbands and wives and children and parents, bosses and those who work for them. We can have our mind on so many things. I took a course many, many years ago, one of the best courses I ever took, and that was in listening comprehension. They taught us in that course that you haven't really listened to somebody express themselves and communicate to you unless you could, after they finished, state what they were saying to you in your own words. If you can do that, then you've listened to them. Well, try that sometime when you're listening to other folks. And some of the people who have the hardest time with all of that are people who are in jobs that require them to sit and listen to others all the time. They talked about bankers having a big problem always listening to the people who come in explaining why they want a loan. Especially the executives. And my teacher for that particular course was always doing extra work for corporations in teaching listening comprehension to their executives. So many executives sit there and nod their hand and give you all of the signals that I know exactly what you're saying. When they don't, they're just waiting to give you the answer they are going to give you in the first place, no matter what you said. So that can be a problem when it comes to understanding God. And we can't allow that to be that way. And in the communication of our lives toward the rest of the world, then we have an obligation to live a life that shows Christ living in us. So the Bible writers are playing into the point. There's no cloud hanging over the Word of God. And there should be no cloud hanging over us as children of God concerning the kind of lives we live for everybody else. Have you ever tried reading a physician's signature? I mentioned that earlier. I don't know how they ever come up with that. You couldn't prove it was their signature by me. It's an impossible task. I think really they have a thing that says, I'm a doctor, I have to write it where you can't read it because that's part of my being a doctor. But on much more serious note, some professing Christians are as difficult to identify as that signature on the prescription. Somebody says, well, I'm a Christian, and my response would be, well, you couldn't prove it by me <laughs> because of the way you live. It, is that being said by us? Our neighbors and friends should not have to wonder what we are, but rather should easily recognize that we are indeed different from the world, not for the sake of being different, but because we don't live on the level of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Last point I'll make concerning this is that an epistle should be free of blobs and blots. <laughs> we don't have to worry too much about that nowadays, but in the days that you were using real ink, that was a problem. That was a problem. If there's a stain or blob of ink on the nice white sheet of paper, that's a distraction to say the least. It makes it hard for people to see what you really wrote. And all else is ignored as one's eyes are drawn to the unsightly blob. As I say, we don't see that much nowadays because we don't have to deal with pen and ink. But it does tell us that there should be nothing in that thing that is a distraction. We shouldn't be trying to hide what we really are being that we are Christians the light of the world salt of the earth or as Paul said known and read of all men child of God faults and sins are easily seen and some people will never go beyond the sins and faults now I know all of us are growing and developing I know that we sin from time to time, 1 John 1, 8 and 10. 
but we surely do not live a life of sin. Colossians 3, 5 through 7. That's the very point being made in Romans 6 and in this passage, saying we are just not living a sinful life. As I understand it from the New Testament, to say that I'm a sinner means I'm practicing sin. And once one is converted to Christ in obedience to the gospel, they don't do that anymore. They're not practicing sin. They're practicing righteousness. They are righteous. They are right living. So we don't need to be basically hypocrites because we show forth too many blobs on our epistle that it confuses people and say, is that really the way Christians live? Is that really the viewpoint that they have? Members of the Lord's church will be known and read of all men, 2 Corinthians 3, 2, period. That's going to happen. And some of those reading are our own children in what we choose to do and how we choose to live and act. I don't think we think of that very much. But the old saying goes, little pictures have big ears. They hear they hear it all, and they see it all. And usually they're doing it when you don't think they are. And so it is in many cases when we don't think people are watching and they're looking, they are, and they're taking note. Or else how could your example ever be an example or an influence for good? It couldn't be. So we need to choose to be the salt of the earth and know what that means, or the light of the world and understand what that means. Because this is the way, according to Matthew 5, 13 through 16, that we glorify the Father who is in heaven. As Paul implored us, read, read, I should say, unto all the brethren, 1 Thessalonians 5, 27. And that's where we are. But I see people coming along and living a life contrary to the doctrine of Christ, I don't conclude they're faithful to Christ. So we need to live the truth. We don't want to be an embarrassment to Christ. Has your children or have you when you were a child ever embarrassed your parents? James, I could use that as just a good stepping stone but I won't do that because the truth of the matter is we all have maybe sometimes more than others well we're children of God do we want to embarrass him I think not so may we live our lives in such a way that we will be exclamation points instead of question marks that would be a good sermon by itself are you an exclamation point? Are you a question mark? But we should be that exclamation point when it comes to the cause of Jesus Christ, which should have more interest to us than anything else on earth. Because if you get that right, you'll be start being what you ought to be as an individual, as a man, woman, husband, wife, father, mother, children, to let Christ guide us and direct. We are then known and read of all men. Let us so conduct our lives that they'll be reading in the right way, the right thing. If you're not a child of the living God, the Bible's clear on what one must do to become a Christian. Belief in Christ is essential. It's necessary. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. If your faith is based on something other than the will of God, it's wrong. Our faith in God is based upon the Word of God. We're then taught that we must repent of our sins, Acts 17.30. Then we're taught to confess our faith in Christ, Romans 10.10. 10. And that then puts us into the position of now the last step, the saving step to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Galatians 3.27 and Acts 2.38. The Lord adds you to His church. There you live faithful to Him, known and read of all men. 
until Christ calls you home. If as a child of God you haven't been faithful, you can remedy that by seriously and from the heart repenting of whatever sin or sins there may be in your life, confessing them and praying God for forgiveness. If you're therefore subject to the call of Christ, the invitation of Christ, we give you this opportunity now to respond to him while we stand and sing.